Hello, and welcome to the Old Soul Archaeology Podcast. My name is Michelle Janae. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Are you ready to dig deep? Hi, my name is Michelle Janae, and this is the first episode of Old Soul Archaeology, and um, my personal episodes are called Point of Departure. So today, for the Point of Departure, I want to give you a little bit of background into who I am, um, how I came to found Old Soul Archaeology, and kind of what my aim is with Old Soul Archaeology as a whole, including the podcast and the guests that will be featured um, in addition to my own personal podcasts. I think in many respects I've always been a seeker, and I, I don't know that I really always understood that. I often felt out of place and there's a part of me that's wondering if that's not true to some degree for everyone, even those who found themselves in the popular groups um, in which I was not one. <laughs> My um, school years were seemingly fraught with always being just on the outside of something. I never had a best friend. Everyone I met always had their best friend and or inner circle and so while I wasn't super ostracized there there was some some of that again I imagine that to some degree everyone feels that I can't imagine that um, that it's not universal in some way but regardless this is kind of how I felt growing up just kind of on the outside, not really belonging, but wanting so badly to to be a part of the group, but also not willing to compromise in many ways in order to be a part of some of those groups. So instead, I guess I, I embraced this seeker self um, or became the seeker, and I was always attracted to human potential, the human potential movement. I read a lot of self-help books. Uh, I joined Amway at a very young age, just out of high school, because I was fairly motivated and I wanted to help, I wanted to help people, but I also wanted to find this sense of purpose that was still lacking and in many ways was would be lacking for quite a number of more years. For some reason I, well, there were, there were a variety of reasons I didn't continue on with college. Although I tried, I enrolled a couple of different semesters at two different uh, community colleges and even took some higher level classes that were available only at the university um, through the community college course program. But I was I was really bored and I don't think I had a great sense of direction. I thought that I would have liked to study psychology but I had some hang-ups around that based on some other decisions and conversations I'd had with uh, with my dad for example. And so I never really found my path in the school system. I was incredibly bored. I have this innate thirst I guess it's it's actually voracious sometimes. This thirst for learning, I love to read. I still read mostly nonfiction books. They aren't as self-helpy, if you will, now. Although I still read some of them, but I'm not. I guess I've I've advanced into what you might call a more spiritual side of of that genre, and not just the material, not just the accomplishment and. Um, material manifestation part of which I, I generally didn't grasp anyways and a lot of that I think had to do with my very Catholic upbringing and my continued search into uh, various but unfortunately dogmatic and controlling uh, religion types such as Mormonism and then born-again Christians. 
So my path, I guess, after high school was to try college and in addition to being bored, in addition to feeling some angst over um, how I would support myself financially and still go to school and I really didn't know what I wanted to do anyways. I, I just went from job to job to job and those jobs I found that I would master quite easily. And I knew I had a knack for learning things very quickly. In fact, a lot of things I was able to teach myself. Um, I'm very autodidactic. And I do consider myself now to be, um, to some level at least, a polymath. Although I don't think that there, I had access to any of the tools back then that would have allowed me to embrace that in a way in the modern workforce that would have led to my success. So in many ways my escapism uh, at the time or just my lack of direction was just to go from job to job and uh, I ended up marrying um, a couple of times that were unsuccessful marriages, the second one lasting 17 years and producing two beautiful daughters but again, I was, st I was looking, I think, for something externally to fulfill me and falling into this idea that this social construct we call marriage needed to last forever now, especially since I was on the second one. It took me 17 years to realize that that would never work out and that I was really not anywhere near myself in that relationship and in my pursuit of the professional me or, or what have you. So about the age of 40, here we advance very quickly, a couple of decades, I was at the end of my rope. I knew I didn't want to be married anymore. I'd already gone through a series of separations and, and, and try-agains and subsequently um, my second daughter was born on in one of those try again moments to to make that marriage work and i i guess i don't know what what woke up inside of me maybe it was the magic number 40 maybe that that was my midlife crisis um at the moment but i i kind of through through meeting uh an angel of sorts <laughs> a person who kind of mentored me and took me under their wing and allowed me to work alongside them in some social social media and marketing and computer website classes and publishing. I ended up writing my first book. I um, self-published that book. But at that time, I also dropped my last name on social media, which for all intents and purposes was my identity socially. The people that I was still communicating with were connected to me via social media and so whether they caught it or not, I'm not sure, but I dropped my last name and simply became Michelle Janae, my first and middle names. And I think that was that was kind of a pivot point for me if I had to look back and and see a time. I mean it was definitely right at forty and and um, certainly a pivot pivotal moment to drop my last name. It would still be another year before I divorced, but the the wheels were set in motion, I guess you could say. So here I am, this 40-year-old woman with two beautiful girls. One is a freshman in high school, one is in um, early grade school, eight years apart. And I'm all of a sudden I'm a single mom with still without any clue about what I want to do with my life <laughs> and um, was learning a lot of new things with I was venturing out into you know my own website and some some projects my I wrote my first book et cetera et cetera but they were all just little tiny droplets in the water there I had yet 
to make a big splash. I still think I have yet to make a big splash, but I feel like I'm getting closer. <laughs> so whether it was fate or kismet or part of the plan, I'm not sure, but I met my current husband who I guess I, I rejected his advances for about six months as I was still processing the separation and divorce that I was going through. And I think that's the part that made all the difference was that that was the part where I owned myself. But then also when I began to start dating him and he accepted me how I was, um, not to say that we have a perfect relationship, but I think that we, we get each other and we, we allow each other to be who we are um, with this amazing sense of love and adoration and it doesn't always make sense especially when looking at relationships outside I mean you might think that we're entirely different species of being and how could that ever work between us but it's actually quite a beautiful thing so we ended up um, moving in together and forming a family and eventually getting married but at the same time, I began to really delve into my, my creative work again, which was painting. And I had happened upon a type of painting called alcohol inks in which um, I'm not sure what the process is manufacturing wise or, or commercially, but inks of a certain type are mixed with alcohol and then sometimes a glycerin type binder and they are a very fluid medium that can be used to paint on non-porous materials so whereas you consider paper as porous it absorbs the paint right away a sheet of glass is considered non-porous and you could actually paint on that although not in the same manner you might paint with watercolor or acrylic it's a very different medium so you you get to know your medium and each of the mediums, even watercolor and, and acrylic and or oil, are completely different in the way they react with their substrate and move and react with each other. So again, here I was exploring this medium called alcohol inks. I learned how to make my own. And part of that process was uh, allowing the art to kind of take on a life of its own because it's very, very difficult to control in a way that made paintings look representational like you might see a a very real life painting of a pastoral countryside scene the alcohol inks were more flowy and ethereal and I guess you could say abstract, but not in the same abstract as, as something that was like cubism or, or you know, straight lines or um, boxes, circles, etc. So anyways, I, I know that getting back into this creative side of me, did I ever realize it would lead me here into a spiritual foray and not, not even close? In fact, about the time I was divorcing and then met my current husband, I didn't want to have anything to do with organized religion at all. I was very burned by a lot of the dogma. I was burned by the fact that it seemed women were the the problems in the marriage. I, certainly my marital problems, according to my church counselors, were my problem and I wasn't being grateful and I needed to I needed to be, be more humble you know be the good wife and it was it was kind of a, a moment of of breaking for me it broke me of this mold that I thought I had to fit and moving forward um, a few years now I'm I'm actually using doodling to meditate and the meditation in and of itself is something that I had never really done before, but I was finding such relief from. And I'm, I'm learning that creativity is holistic and it's, it is spiritual. It is actually connection to source and 
it is natural in all of us, although it is largely overshadowed and denied by other social functions that are deemed more important, like rationality, linear thinking. Um, it's funny, even problem solving is largely devoid of creativity and imagination in many aspects in our institutions. So again, my, my reading, I'm sure, develops through this time. And I, I go through various business names. I, I develop a career coaching um, business, but I'm largely dissatisfied because I find that the clients I'm working with simply just want the resume, the right resume, and they want the job. They just want the job. They're not really concerned with their life purpose. They want to um, get a job so that they can pay their bills. And, and I guess, you know, th there were times when that's why I took a job, but I was never really satisfied in myself. And so certainly trying to help someone else just get a job felt very, very empty to me. I wanted to do something of a higher nature. And I thought if that's what they needed, perhaps someone else could serve them better by writing their resume or coaching them through a process that they weren't even really vested in. Um, I had various creative business iterations, one called Ideaforium, like the auditorium for Ideaforia. And Ideaforia being something I'm plagued with, <laughs> which is a lot of ideas. Um, in fact, it's Ideaphoria is a mixture of eufor euphoria and ideas. So Ideaphoria became the mixture of three words for me, which was the auditorium that housed the euphoria of the ideas. <laughs> I rebranded it at one point and named my business Rise Up Creativity with the idea of a phoenix rising from the ashes and started to develop some, some things in that area of, I guess, kind of a creative rebirth. But something still didn't fit right for me. Something was still off. And I, I don't know what it was or how I came across the idea. Again, I have a lot of ideas, so a lot of times it's hard to pinpoint um, where they're coming from. But eventually, my business morphed from per perpetual career management to raise it to idea for you, uh, idea for him, and not necessarily in that order to rise up creativity rise up creativity and then to old soul archaeology and I guess the whole idea behind old soul archaeology was I think for me the remembering or rediscovery that I was somehow more than what I thought it was. I was connected to source. I was connected to a creative channel that I could use in my life and for higher purpose, for greater good. I, in, at some point, I died in Reiki 1 and Reiki 2. And now there's definitely this universal energy that can be said to be spiritual certainly almost anything that's not our normal five senses and what we think of in the Western world as reality is is, is spiritual. It's like we're, we're completely missing that angle on so many levels in spite of our quote-unquote Christian uh, traditions in this country based on our founders' ideas. We, we, ver we very much lack a spirituality in the Western world because we are so focused on the physical world, the five physical senses, the linear, rationalistic, logical thinking model, the, what you might call the Newtonian Cartesian model, where everything is reduced to its simplest form and taken apart and analyzed and studied until it, there's pretty much nothing left. And we don't really see things as, as the whole. We've basically taken all the parts. So you'll never see the whole pizza. <laughs> you just get a, a sliver of it. So old soul archaeology forms, and really it's, it's a journey. It's about digging deep, the archaeology part, 
right? We're, we're going to find treasures, but we do have to dig. We have to do some inner work. It's a journey um, because life is a journey. I like to think of a lot of our, our work that we do with Old Soul Archaeology as expeditions. Um, we're going into unfamiliar territories. We're finding connections to not just our physical past, our ancestral past, but really our spiritual past, our higher self past, our source. And so now I guess I, I feel like my calling is, I feel like I'm on, on the right road finally. And I never did get the college degree and I never did really find my place in the corporate world. Not for lack of trying. I even had jobs that normally would have required degrees and I found out that it was a rat race <laughs> and I wasn't a rat. It, I, it wasn't somewhere that I wanted to be and it took me a long time to realize that, to really own that. And due to some crazy circumstances, I don't have to be in that rat race now and so I can focus on um, my path. And for a long time I even thought that I had to be in the rat race and figure out a way to walk the spiritual path while being there. But I know that one way or another, whatever my story is, someone will relate. It's, it's this way for a reason. So while I started to realize some five, six years ago that as frustrated as I was in some of those jobs, I was exactly where I was supposed to be and I couldn't see the future, I didn't know where I was going, but I, I started to, I guess, be more present and accept where I was. That didn't mean I didn't go home frustrated beyond belief some days at the conditions or the the injustices or the sometimes just the downright stupidity of the way I thought a workplace was functioning and or not functioning, but it was a turning point and and I think that's really important for this spiritual path is that people don't expect it to be like flipping a switch not that that can't happen you know I suppose that that happened to the Buddha and um, you know sudden enlightenment sitting underneath the Bodhi tree but for most of us, it's a process. It's a day-by-day -day walk, and sometimes it's a trudge in mud. <laughs> but I'm even now when I'm in mud, I feel a whole lot better than I used to be in mud. And I know I have people around me that that support me. Um, two years ago, I went on my first uh, retreat. It was a shamanic retreat in um, the Bay Area of California and it was it wasn't without its own challenges and difficulties but it really opened my eyes to a lot of possibilities and still yet every day in fact just in the last couple of weeks I'm venturing into territory I never thought that I would even venture into based on the conditioning and beliefs and upbringing that I had. And it's fascinating and you'll hear a lot of it in upcoming episodes of Old Soul Archaeology, um, primarily with my Old Soul Sojourns. Those are the, the time that we spend with my guests. A sojourn simply means like a stay over, a stop over. Um, and so we will spend time in these sojourns with my guests. I'm excited to bring their stories to you. I'm excited to continue to tell my own. Um, I don't know if I've done justice for you as to what my story is. It, that was kind of a hodgepodge, but I'm going to go with it because it's just time. It's time to, to put this out there regardless of what it looks like and um, as they say, let the chips fall where they may and know that as I do this, um, as with all things, continued practice means continued progress. So um, Old Soul Archaeology is really about digging deep. It's about finding our place in the world as 
our true selves and finding finding our genuine nature, our authentic nature. The craziest thing about this to me in all of this is that we are all in this same place. If we'd only wake up to that one simple fact that we are all on this journey of discovery, we all have this angst to be who we are, maybe just that one simple realization would allow us to see our fellow brother or sister with a little more kindness, knowing that their struggle is just as real as ours, that they don't have it all figured out, that they're searching just like we are, that regardless of appearances, behind the scenes, things may be very, very different. They may be trying to let you know that they're the Wizard of Oz and behind the curtain they're just this small, frightened little old man that's creating some illusions that may or may not reflect what's really going on. More than anything, I want to share my heart with you. I want to share what I've found to be universal truths with you. Um, but my caution to you is to always consider what you hear on my podcast and take what works. Leave the rest behind. It doesn't require criticism. It doesn't require um, pensive contemplation. If it works for you, accept it. If you feel led to contemplate, that's great. If it doesn't work for you, that's okay. We're going to broach some subjects that for some people might be uncomfortable. And yet, I really believe that the elephant in the room is that it's on everybody's minds. This quest, this desire to know, this need for understanding is on everyone's minds. And it's a spiritual quest. It's a quest that goes way beyond our physical reality, a reality that in many ways is not working for us as we see things spiral out of control, as we see things approach an edge, a precipice that looks as if it, there is you know, nothing to do but um, fall to an abyss below. The elephant in the room, I believe, is that what is on my mind is also on your mind. And so it is my hope, as this podcast progresses, that we can share and that we can say, hey, you know what, I've been thinking about that too, and I really don't know what to think about it, but I've been thinking about it. I really don't know how to process that based on who I am and where I've been or who I think I am and how I was brought up, but I've been thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you for opening the door or opening the window or shining a light or whatever it is for you. And the cool thing about the elephant it's like that old parable where the all of the old blind men go out and they're asked to feel what's in, immediately in front of them and describe it. And of course they're describing, each one of them describes something entirely different based on what part of the elephant they're touching. One's got the tail and they might describe it as a snake and one's got a, a hind leg and it's all hairy, bristly, dry, caked with mud. One has the underbelly and it's super soft and warm and one has the trunk and it feels like something completely different and one has an ear and this might be a, a blanket. This elephant in the room is that. It is so multifaceted and it's going to look different to each of us depending on how we approach it, the direction we're coming from and yet what happens when we share. Let's imagine all of those blind men sitting down together 
and maybe they get together with the forensic artist, I guess you would call it. We're going to bring in the forensic artist, and we are going to have this artist to compile their experience of this elephant. Now, nobody knows it's an elephant yet, but the artist will bring this image to life. And so as we bring our respective experiences of this elephant in the room together, we together are the forensic artist and we'll start to form a cohesive idea about what it means to be human and what our higher self is and what it wants for us and our connection to source and the meaning of love, not worldly love, but that universal unconditional love that's so elusive for all of us. I can feel the power of this image. And it doesn't matter the words, that we use different words to describe it, that we, that the traditions are different or the, the rituals are different or that the, the ideas in their material sense are different. In the spiritual sense, it is one holistic and unified image. And I hope that you'll stay tuned and continue to explore that with me. This has been Point of Departure. My name is Michelle Janae on Old Soul Archaeology. Thank you for tuning in.